Walker in the School of Urban Studies and Planning, and along with a couple of my colleagues, Chris Monsier and Rob Bertini, who's walking in the door right now, we help co-organize this weekly transportation uh, seminar uh, through the Center for Transportation Studies. And um, one uh, logistical thing for those of you who haven't visited us before, uh, we do webcast the seminar live, and we also put archives of them on the web. We have years of, of seminars on the web if you want to watch them. Uh, but one of the things that that requires is for all of us to use these microphones that for most of you, there is one in front of you. So if you ask a question of the speaker, you do need to hold on the touch button with the red light glowing while you're asking the question so people watching on the web can hear the question. So re please remember to do that, and I uh, will bug you if you don't. So, um, and I prefer not to do that. So uh, without further ado, I am going to introduce Mark Schlossberg. He's an assistant professor in planning, public policy, and management at the University of Oregon, one of our partners in our new transportation center. And I'm just going to turn it over to you to say a little bit more about yourself and then launch into your topic. Great. Thanks, Jennifer, and welcome. Thanks for coming during your lunch hour or otherwise. So I'll just give you a, a little bit of background about me to begin with. Um, I was a DJ as an undergraduate, which has nothing to do with today's talk, but you know, sometimes it's nice to relive your gloriful, gloried past. And so anytime I get a chance to r remind myself of this picture, uh, I do. So um, I have an undergraduate degree from the University of Texas in marketing, a master's degree uh, from San Jose, Sa San Jose State in planning, and a PhD from the University of Michigan in planning with a, uh, a minor or certificate in transportation logistics studies. Uh, in between my master's and my PhD, I was a Peace Corps volunteer in Fiji as a rural development advisor for one year, and for the second year, I was working with a counterpart to develop the first uh, GIS uh, base map for census mapping in the country. So that was kind of neat. I've been at the University of Oregon. Uh, this is my fifth year, so I've been there four and a half years. I'm the director of the undergraduate program, and I'm also the, uh, the U of O's uh, representative uh, to this new University Transportation Center, which is the collaborative or, uh, transportation research center in Oregon between Portland State, Oregon State, and the University of Oregon, Oregon Institute of Technology. So I'm uh, still learning uh, the players in the state, um, but I'm looking forward to that partnership and the work in transportation that's going to be happening here. It's pretty exciting. So if you have questions about me later on, just feel free to ask. Um, I don't know much music since 1991, uh, so... <laughs> Don't ask me about music since 1991. All right, so today what I'm going to talk about, uh, first I'm going to give an overview of some street-based walkability measures that uh, I've been using in some research projects. And I'll be showing some examples of how to apply those measures to both transit-oriented developments and have a couple Portland examples, uh, and also to school issues of how kids get to school uh, using four middle schools in Oregon. Um, I'll uh, talk about some additional research on the school issue with how kids uh, get to school and the relationship between their physical activity and the urban form. And finally, I'm going to conclude with uh, outlining, outlining a new a tool or a new approach to gather data around urban form and the walkable environment using handheld GIS uh, on a PDA. So the initial descriptions of uh, walkability using streets is going to be a little bit more simplistic, and then at the end, I'll add some nuance and some more complexity into how those measures can be used. So a few of these slides, some of you may have seen before, especially if you've ever been in the room with Michael Ronkin, uh, who is the bike ped manager at ODOT. Uh, so he, if anyone has seen his presentations, he does about 400 PowerPoint slides in 20 minutes and lots of images, so he's a great source for these types of images. But the basis of the talk today is, is we build all kinds of different communities, uh, such as uh, what you see here. And um, we're not necessarily building them with walkability in mind or how you get from one place to the next. So the way we build places, we take a, what should be a fairly short walk from my house to your house. And to get there requires such a crazy route that it no longer becomes uh, possible, really, for walking. Imagine yourself as a parent allowing your child to walk from a friend's house in the suburban neighborhood. That freedom for both you as a parent and for the child uh, becomes reduced or eliminated because of the way that we build our, our neighborhoods. And of course, there's all different kinds of ways that neighborhoods are built. And the way that the streets are created and the pattern and the placement of those streets really form both the space of the neighborhood 
and the capacity to get around within the neighborhood and from your neighborhood elsewhere. So there's all kinds of different models of the way that they're built. So here's sort of two extreme typical, extreme but also, well not extreme, but kind of typical examples. On the left, we have a, a grid, traditional grid network, and on the right, a, 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 you know, a loops and lollipops, a cul-de-sac uh, area, a more of a suburban type of development. And if you were to go to school from home here on the right, first you have to exit your neighborhood, get out to an arterial, walk along another arterial before you get to school if you were to walk. And what, again, takes a fairly short distance, becomes a long distance. And then you, of course, have to do the walk back. Whereas in a neighborhood that is characterized by a more uh, gridded street pattern with more connectivity, internal connectivity, you have all kinds of uh, choices in the routes that you take to get to, to your destination. Your route is more direct, shorter, and in this case, you don't have to cross any arterials. And when we're talking, especially about kids getting to school, uh, which we'll talk about, as, uh, which I'll talk about later, crossing major barriers like arterials is a big is a big issue. So, there's all kinds of different ways that the street layout streets have been laid out, and there's all different kinds of ways that you can assess and evaluate and measure. Those, those layouts. So, you, of course, you can do the visual representation. But you can also pull out the intersections and look at the pattern, distribution, and types of intersections, four ways, three ways, where the cul-de-sacs are. You can measure the linear feet of streets in an area, calculate the density of intersections per square mile, etc. And I'll go through a few examples of what I've been doing to look at transit-oriented developments in areas around school using these types of basic concepts. So for this presentation and for the work that I've been involved in, I really believe that streets and the street network provides a really good basis to evaluate walkability. Now we know that not all streets are walkable and not all places that you walk are uh, along the street. So if you have an off-street pedestrian path, for example. But for the most part, streets are the core places um, where people are walking to get from here and there. So part of the analysis here is to quantify uh, the pedestrian and auto-oriented roads in a given area, in a local neighborhood area, and to segregate or, or make a distinction between what is pedestrian-oriented and which is really either auto-oriented or I'm, I like to think about it more as, more as pedestrian hostile. So places that you'd like to walk as a pedestrian and places that you're going to avoid if you're going to walk. You might make the mistake once of going along a major road that you don't like, but the second time you walk to that route, you'll choose an alternative path if you can. I'll show some uh, tools for measuring the connectivity that, of the street network and, ident and identifying zones of likely walkability. And again, we'll apply these to transit-oriented developments and to school areas. So there's a series of outputs uh, that result from some of the GIS analysis that I'll show you. And we can think about these in terms of the quality, the quantity, or the quality, sorry, the proximity and the connectivity of the street network. So from the quality perspective, we can classify streets as pedestrian friendly to pedestrian hostile as sort of the, our most simplistic measure. By measuring the miles of minor roads versus major roads, what's the ratio between minor roads to major roads, and what's the density of, of maybe minor or pedestrian friendly roads in a per square mile, for example. A proximity type of analysis I'll talk about something called a pedestrian catchment area and an impeded pedestrian catchment area. I'll give definitions in a slide or two. And then the connectivity. So looking at the intersections as a measure of how connected an area is and how easy uh, and pedestrian friendly it is to get from one place to another within the neighborhood. So the, the uh, first and sort of core piece that I want to introduce here is the idea of classifying the streets into different categories for, for the analysis. And this is distinguishing, again, between pedestrian-friendly and pedestrian-unfriendly or hostile roads. And so you can imagine a situation in any of the neighborhoods where we live where if you look at all the streets, you look something like that, or if you categorize them as, in this case, neighborhood streets versus arterials and collectors, which in the bold, if we were to remove, if we were to say all collectors and arterials are not friendly places to walk, and I know that's an overstatement, but if we're just for now, if we were to state that and remove those from our universe as pedestrians, as places we're not going to walk along, then you get an actual street network that looks something like this. This is actually the Beaverton uh, 
uh, just south of the Beaverton transit stop. And so you get an area where you're south of the transit stop, but to get to actually do the transit stop, you can only do it by walking along and crossing sort of these pedestrian hostile roads. And at least in the Beaverton example, they aren't so nice to walk along. So this idea of actually distinguishing one road type from another and doing the analysis on walkability, not where all, all the roads are, but only which ones are actually uh, amenable to pedestrian travel that are nice to, to be there, that pedestrians are actually likely to use is a theme that I, I'm going to draw through all the different analyses that I'll show. So we can look at all the intersections um, and dead ends in an area. So using GIS, we can calculate, visualize, and quantify the density and the placement of intersections at dead ends across space. So this is actually the Lloyd Transit, Transit Center right here. The circles are all the intersections, and there's some triangles here that are dead ends. And this is based on all the streets, where all the intersections are dead ends. If we were to remove the streets that you wouldn't walk along, you get something that's a little bit different. So you have these areas where, over here you have intersections, right? So you have a neighborhood road crossing an arterial. But if you were to remove that arterial from a place that you would walk along, so you're not going to be able to walk along that when you're going north and you get to this arterial, it's not a true intersection for you as a pedestrian. You can cross through it, but it's no longer an intersection. So if you have to get over to this area, you might walk up and across on a, on a uh, more pedestrian-friendly street and then go hook up instead of going up to the arterial and moving over. So it reduces the number of intersections in your calculation and in your density measure. And the same thing with dead ends, where you'd have a, a, a T intersection where a neighborhood street would dead end into an arterial. Effectively, that becomes a faux dead end to you as a pedestrian. And I've been trying for a year and a half to come up with a better term than a faux dead end, and I've been putting the challenge out. So if you can think of a better name than a faux dead end, uh, let me know. You can even it can be your, sort of your name and a dead end. We'll just name it after you or something if you come up with a good one. So you can take the the um, the density of uh, the intersections and as, as a visualization uh, tool, uh, create this type of surface map based on the density of, in this case, three and four-way intersections. And so this is a Ranko station, and um, there's been some more build-out just south of the station since this data was put together. But what, the darker colors are places with high internal connectivity of the street network. And so you can see the areas of high sort of walkability along that measure and the relationship between those areas and where the transit stop is. You can also identify where the holes of the street connectivity exists. And Orenco Station is pretty interesting because the big walkable area in the initial part that was built is up here between a quarter and a half mile, and much actually extends beyond a half mile from the transit stop. I know a lot has been, been built uh, down here since the, this study was put together. So this is a, a way to visualize the, the connectivity of the area. So then you do an analysis or a look at sort of the zones of likely walkability with something that's sometimes referred to as a ped shed or something that I'm calling a pedestrian catchment area and an impeded pedestrian catchment area. And basically, if you take the uh, assumption that uh, you can only walk, people are only willing to walk a quarter mile or a third of a mile or a half mile from a transit stop to access that transit stop, you get this usually this uh, nice circular buffer. So what's going on within a half mile of the transit stop? So there's an area of that circle. But really, we can't walk wherever we want to walk. We have to walk actually along the paths that are there, the street network. And so uh, you walk along these paths. And if you were to walk that same half mile, maybe you'd get to this point. You could get to this point. You could get to this point and this point. And then you connect all those dots, and you create this other polygon that you calculate the area. And you divide the area of that walkable area along the street network by sort of the theoretical area of just as the crow flies, and you get a ratio between zero and one. So the higher the number, representing sort of the greater the street network gives you coverage to, to access the maximum part of that circle, the better. And so a number between 0.5 and 0.6 seems to represent an area where the street network actually allows you to, to reach out um, close to that theoretical circle. The difference between a pedestrian catchment area and an impeded pedestrian catchment area is that with the PCA, you use all the streets. With the impeded pedestrian catchment area, you, you repeat the 
the calculation, but only using those streets, those pedestrian-friendly streets. And so here's an example. So uh, there's a, imagine a quarter mile circle, and then this is the half mile circle. So along the street network, all, using all the streets, this inter light gray is a, how far you can go from the Lloyd Transit Center, a uh, transit stop of a quarter mile. Uh, this outer polygon is a half mile using the streets. If you were only to use, say, the pedestrian friendly streets or avoid the arterials, then, of course, this whole southern area is cut off because the only way to get north of the freeway south is on a, on a pretty major street over the, the bridge over the freeway. And so you get this area now that's, that's, that's cut off. So rather than thinking that actually this is, is our whole entire catchment area of that transit stop, now there's some a refinement of what we might think is, is that potential area. And what that can tell us as planners or policymakers is that this is an area that could probably use some good urban design to mitigate the potential hostile effects of sort of a, being a major auto corridor. So you get this truncated walkable zone due, due to the presence of the auto dominant roads. This is the same idea, but just overlaid that the pedestrian catchment area in this particular example would be this whole area, so the purple plus the orange. When you take out your capacity to move this way on that major road, it reduces the zone of walking. So you have to sort of cross over and then across to get to some of those areas. So you can look at all these different types of analyses at the same time using sort of small multiples, small images of multiple types of analysis to try to understand how a particular area is performing in terms of its walkability using these types of measures. So you classify the streets into uh, friendly and hostile pedestrian roads, do these different analyses, and, and take a look. Actually, let me go back. So in this case, uh, we're back to Lloyd. So we get to actually visually see the layout of where the, the more auto-oriented roads, uh, or dominant roads, are located in relation to the transit stop using all the streets where you can get, considering where the location of those auto dominant roads are, what place is cut off, and then where are the areas of really good internal connectivity, highly walkable spaces. So in the Lloyd Center example, I mean all around the Lloyd Center, actually not right super close, but all sort of around this quarter to a half mile and even beyond, there's a really nice integrated grid of a street network. But we, so we can look at this, there's this great walkable area that the, the catchment area doesn't quite reach because the only way to get from the transit stop down is along that road. So you can begin to sort of make connections between these different types of analyses, all based on just using the street network. So it's really sort of one source of data allowing a lot of different types of analysis to get a, a sense of, of the space. Beaverton is just a nice one to show <laughs> in a bad kind of way. Um, because the, the only way that you can get from the Beaverton station is a little path that leads you right out onto a major arterial. So you're kind of stuck to get anywhere. That said, so, again, south of the transit stop is the old downtown part of the area, and it's a really nice walkable grid. But to get there, you have to cross and navigate through this network of streets that, that really are a barrier, really are a barrier. So I'm not going to go through these numbers other than to, to, to say that there's all kinds of quantitative output that you can calculate from, from this. So minor road miles, uh, major road miles, intersection density, dead end density, and impedance-based intersection density, so the intersections when you take out the, the hostile roads. And you can start to, to make some calculations and either develop thresholds for the city or for an area of minimum standards you want to meet with these types of uh, density of intersections, for example, or you can begin to compare spaces. So um, part of this original research project on TOD is a piece of it uh, that was done by a graduate student of mine, Nat Brown, who works for Metro now, was to actually compare 11 different transit stops in Portland based on these measures and sort of rate them um, and from good to bad based on these different types of measures. And of course, uh, some people like the visual, that speaks to them, and some people like the numbers, that speaks to them. So there are different ways to get at um, uh, understanding how a place is performing and also communicating that information to others. And in this case, there's also sort of a before and after how things change over time. So as you designate or improve streets in different ways, how is that impacting the walkability of the area? 
So it's not just transit. So there's the idea of walkability is relevant to all kinds of things. So I'll talk about schools here in a moment, but it could be access to, to uh, markets, food markets, access to religious institutions, access to parks. Um, access to parking structures is something that I'm kind of interested in because once you park your car, you're a pedestrian. So what's the pedestrian environment like after you park your car? Um, to health clinics, I mean, this can really be expanded to all kinds of different ways. And what I think is interesting, this is a political campaign in Montana, is that this issue of how kids get to their school, the physical activity and the environment within which and the types of neighborhoods we're building is, is coming up as a political issue. So I, I actually don't know if she won. Um, does anyone know if Marlene Hutchins won this race? <laughs> so I don't know if it's a good political issue yet uh, or not. Uh, but the idea that you know, will, uh, when he's old enough to walk to school, will his school be close enough? So where are schools located? How do you get to them? Are they integrated within a neighborhood? Is the neighborhood even walkable? Can your kids even walk to school? It's becoming a, a pretty big issue. So I'm going to go through a study uh, that uh, occurred here in Oregon uh, on how, it was sort of two pieces of it. One was what's the school siting process that goes on in the state? So when new schools are built, what's the decision-making process behind that on where they go and why? And another piece that I'm going to focus on is how do kids actually get to school? And what's the relationship between urban form or the form of their neighborhood and whether they walk to school or not? And so mail surveys were sent out to middle school students to their homes. And uh, these were for four middle schools, two in Bend and two in Springfield, Oregon. So we knew the addresses of all the, of all the kids. So we geocoded them in the map so that we could calculate the actual distance from their home to school. So we could know what the relationship between distance and how they get to school would be. And then we computed these urban form measures that uh, I just went through. And so these are the four schools. So two of the schools, uh, Springfield Middle School and Pilot Butte uh, Middle School in the Bend area, are both, we chose those because they're both more sort of traditional neighborhood, more centrally located schools. And then we had two sprawl schools, we called them, or out on the schools out on the fringe. So Agnes Stewart in, uh, in Springfield and Skyview Middle School out in Bend. And this is really is a sprawl school because the urban growth boundary is right here. School is right inside the urban growth boundary. And then, of course, because the school was built out on the edge of town, no one lived near there yet. Maybe sometime in the future, the housing will creep closer. But for now, you, there, uh, there isn't that much housing nearby. So, of course, to get there, you have to build the street infrastructure to get there. So there's these pretty major roads right here, high-speed, fast roads for cars to get there. So that even when the population and the housing creeps closer, Already the infrastructure of these high-speed arterial roads have been put in place, creating permanent barriers, permanent potential barriers for kids walking to these schools. So we are interested in, in how do these school locations and their placement within different uh, urban forms impact how the kids are getting to school. I'm just going to put this up here for a few seconds, but I'm not going to go through this either. I'll have some summary of what it all means. But again, the idea is that there's a sort of a quantitative basis to some of the, the findings that I'll present in a, in a moment. And you, you can start to, again, make thresholds and comparisons across the four schools. Uh, but don't try to decipher this right now. I'll have some better things to help, help walk us through it. Here's a simplified version. So here's step number one of understanding the previous table. So you have pluses when they scored well, and minuses when they scored poorly, and, and circles for it's kind of neutral. And so in spring, Springfield and Bend, one fringe school, one central school. And so the basic message is, is that um, uh, the centralized schools scored well, uh, mostly well, all well on, uh, on these measures, and then the fringe schools were either neutral to, to negative. So after we collected the survey data and geocoded the uh, survey responses, we divided folks into people who lived within a mile and a half and people who lived beyond a mile and a half. So in Oregon, for middle school, there's a mile and a half zone around school that beyond which busing is provided. So that was our threshold of, of cutting off to try to understand some walking and biking behavior. 
And we uh, asked how you get to school, what mode do you use, how frequently do you use that mode, and the same thing on how do you get home from school. And interestingly enough, uh, the, the rate, the, the walking and biking to school, mostly the walking, is different than the way home. So across um, all the schools, actually, uh, both even the fringe schools and the centralized, central, centrally located schools, walking rates were pretty high, uh, and the central schools were actually quite high and, and much different than uh, on the fringe schools. And the walk home, 30% of kids walking home from these sprawl schools is, I mean, that's, that's quite high. The national average is around 13%. So even in these sprawl schools in Oregon, we're seeing a high rate of walking. In the central, central, more centrally located schools, the rates are even higher. And this was pretty fun. So, you know, how do you explain this? <laughs> right, so when I first saw this, how do you explain that more people bike home than bike to school? And after I saw this number, the next week when I was taking my kids to school, I literally saw a parent taking a bike out of their trunk. So the parent drove their kid to school with the bike, and then the kid biked home. So it it's, uh, can happen. Yeah, so it wasn't just bad data entry. So just from this uh, 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 table and the numbers that I didn't really go through, the basic message from the initial analysis was that schools that had higher walking rates also had better measurable walkable infrastructure, suggesting a relationship between urban form and walking behavior. So then we took the data sort of one step further. So instead of looking at sort of the school as the unit of analysis, we just looked at all of the individual students independently. And so we created an, an individual measure of urban form for each student. So we knew where they lived, we knew where their school was. So what we did is we calculated or we derived their most uh, efficient, most direct path from home to school because we didn't know the a actual path that they took. And then we buffered it by an eighth of a mile on either side. So we gave each student sort of a quarter mile zone between their home and school that they could potentially travel within. And within that, we calculated the, the density of intersections, so the intersections per square mile, the dead ends per square mile within their zone, and whether they had to cross a major arterial or a railroad. So are, was there something about the urban form in terms of major arterials or railroads with, that may be got in the way of them walking to school? And these are the general results. So thankfully, there was something to say. Um, so students, in this analysis, students with high densities of intersections in their urban form were three or more times likely to walk, three or more times. So really pointing to the impact of good connected urban form on whether kids are going to walk to school. <coughs> Students with no major roads or railroads to cross were twice as likely to walk to school. So again, it's another indication of the importance of urban form. And it may not be that it's actually uh, dangerous to cross the railroad track or the arterial. It may be a parent's influence on whether their kids are going. Nonetheless, the issue is, is uh, applicable to whether the kids are making the decision or their parents are or influencing it. And dead end, dead end density didn't really show anything conclusive in this. So the, the, den, the dead ends per square mile didn't really show up as anything important to note. And that the urban form measures that were included in this analysis didn't predict biking, which makes sense. So, but it's important to recognize. So we often, in the transportation area or in the planning area or in the policy area, we have automobile usage, transit usage, and ped bike as though ped bike is the same thing. And they're really two separate modes with their own needs for infrastructure and travel. And that, that showed up here in this analysis, that the measures that were predicting walking behavior didn't predict bike behavior, suggesting that, there's, that the measures that we used really were walkable measures and not for the biking, not for biking. So we asked um, on the survey that parents filled out, you know, why, essentially, why doesn't your kid walk to school? And that's what we wanted to know. And this is what, and so we had a whole list that, that uh, parents could check off as many reasons as they wanted. And then we c combined them and created these categories that seemed to make sense for us. So first, convenience. So the number one reason why parents 
didn't have their kids walk to school was just out of convenience. So this could be parent going to work in the morning, drop their kid off on the way to school. It's just easier to do rather than walking the kid to school, then coming back home and, and going to work. Or maybe it's just easier. Or people think it saves time. Just this idea of convenience. The urban form uh, did come up um, a little bit more prominently in this fringe areas that the urban form wasn't conducive to walking. So it was more of an issue out in the fringe than in the centrally located schools. And then what I think is really interesting, especially for the fringe schools, is that across all these different areas, convenience, urban form, school requirement, which is like you have to bring projects or carry heavy books and therefore you can't walk or you have to bring a tuba to and from school so walking isn't an issue. Personal safety, physical comfort. At the fringe school, they're actually all, all closely aligned. I mean, there's some difference, but they're, they all kind of gravitate around this plus or minus 20%. So the urban form is clearly an issue, but it's one of many issues that's going on here. So the, the, the idea of getting more kids to walk to school isn't based entirely on improving the connectivity of the street network or improving the urban design of the area. So then we ask the question, okay, what would it take for you to allow your child to walk to school? So you don't currently, so what would it take to do it? And again, there was a whole series of options that could be chosen, and we grouped them into these categories, accompanied by other children, safety crossings, if there were safety crossings across busy streets, if there was more enforcement of the speed limit, and if there were sidewalks along the route, and never, like I would never allow my child to walk to school. So uh, what's really uh, quite interesting is that this idea of if my child would go to school with other children was sort of the number one reason that parents cited as allowing their kids to go to school. And it was kind of mixed between whether there had to be an adult with that group or not. So parents weren't saying, I'll only let my child go to school if there's, a, if there's other children and an adult with that group. So some parents said that, but other parents said, it's okay if there's no parent there, I just want my kid going with another group. So if they don't get distracted or safety in numbers, they all get there at the same time. And what I think is also really interesting is the number of parents who said never. So really 10% or fewer said, I'll never do it. And these are just the parents who live within a mile and a half of school. So with only 10% saying, I'll never allow my kid to go to school, it means there's really a nice window of opportunity to get more kids in active transportation to school if the right combination of interventions are there whether they're program, programmatic interventions, urban design interventions, what have you. And then sidewalks along the school route um, were less important actually out in the fringe areas, which tend to be newer developments and probably all have sidewalks built in as part of the code, and was uh, mentioned more in centralized areas, so it might have a nicer gridded street network, but not all the streets have sidewalks because they were built long before sidewalks were required as part of the development. All right, so what are the implications from all of this? So urban form is important for active travel to school. So I think that's sort of the key message here, that it, that there is, uh, it is important, and we showed sort of statistically that it's an, a, a factor in predicting the children's walking to school. But urban form is only one of many factors influencing child's travel mode to school. And that the zone of interest of school, for school issues at least, should actually be extended beyond the typical planning ranges. So I didn't mention this before, but when we looked at the, at the individual child level of, of how they get to school, the um, children were actually walking uh, pretty regularly up to a mile and a half from school, which was pretty interesting. So it wasn't the quarter mile that planners use for adults, a quarter to a third mile. It wasn't the half mile when we feel generous on what the population will actually potentially walk to. Kids were actually walking uh, up to a mile and a half. And in a mile and a half, it cut off sharply, probably because of the school bus kicks, kicked in. And then in terms of a policy or a programmatic intervention, the idea of a walk bus or a walk pool where a, a parent picks up kids along the way as they're walking or biking to school and other kids sort of join in along the way seems to be a really appropriate intervention here. So the parents saying, yes, I'd let my kids walk to school if they were only accompanied by other kids, really speaks to the potential of having this walk bus or walk pool type of, of effort implemented. 
especially for the TRIP2 school, I should say. The TRIP2 school is a far easier place to make this type of program work because it's, it's predictable. School starts at a certain time and everyone has to be at the same time. The TRIP home gets a little bit more complicated. Some kids go to a friend's house or to after school soccer. Some kids come home. So the coordination, the logistics of organizing a group of kids to walk home is a little bit more complicated. But for at least for the TRIP2 school, it seems to be a, a very appropriate intervention. And then again, walking and biking measures are different and should be treated as such. And I think, it's, I think we're hopefully at this time where we can begin thinking of ped and bike as different issues that require their own sets of understanding and their own sets of analysis and their own sense, uh, sets of, of intervention of programs and policy. All right, so this brings us to sort of the last segment of what I'll talk about today. And that's this, you know, what makes a street walkable? So up until this point, I've just really presented arterials, bad, neighborhood streets, good. And we all know that we can have a major arterial with nice urban design that's a very nice place to walk. And there could be neighborhood streets that are actually quite rotten to walk along. So then how do we take this to the next level of, of really making a better refined assessment of what a street segment how a street segment performs in terms of how walkable it is. And so I'm going to walk through a, a new tool that I've been um, working with with uh, others um, call, uh, called a pedestrian audit instrument. And the, the version I've been working on is a, this audit tool that uses mobile GIS technology. So on a little handheld PDA computer like a Palm Pilot, you can put the GIS software directly onto it and go out in the field or in the streets walking along the sidewalk in a particular street segment and look around you and measure and quantify and collect all the different aspects of that environment that are good or bad for walking. So it's a way to get really nuanced data around the urban form in a particular area. So you collect the street data in the field, you include as many variables as uh, desired and as money you have to hire people to collect the data, uh, and that the real key here is that data is collected within a GIS environment already, so that after you collect the data, you just come back to your office, the, the city's office, who's ever office, and it's already in GIS format, so it's just ready to be, to be mapped and analyzed if that's part of your the way that you analyze data. So I'm going to walk through uh, some screens and some of the measures that are on this particular tool. So the, the tool as it stands now is called the Pedestrian Environmental Data Scan, or PEDS, for ArcPED, the core instrument, the PEDS instrument, has actually been developed by uh, Kelly Clifton, Professor Kelly Clifton at the University of Maryland and her PhD student, Andy Levy, and uh, Professor Daniel Rodriguez at the University of North Carolina. And so I've been involved in translating their tool into this mobile GIS environment and in testing the tool out for future revisions of it. So basically, there's what a little PDA looks like. And you have, in this case, the street network on there. You essentially just tap the street. So you're in the street. You put labels on here. You know that you're actually standing on this street. You tap the street, and up pops some data entry screens. There's actually, in this particular tool, there's 12 different screens. I'll go with, I, I realize it might be a little bit difficult to read some of this in the back, but I'll walk through the basic categories. So in this case, um, start off with some... Um, Subjective questions. How attractive is uh, the street <clears throat> for walking? How attractive is it for biking? How safe do you feel walking here? How safe would you feel biking here? So subjective questions. What is your perception of this space? Actually, let me, before I go on with all the other tools, there's many different ways we can think about applying this type of work. So asking subjective questions like this makes some people very uneasy. How can you ask subjective questions because you can't generalize out? because your perception is different than your perception, which is different from my perception. And in some types of analysis, that's true. That's a problem. But people's perceptions of how they interact with the environment is very important, especially when you're talking about community-scaled types of analysis, so such as the area around a school. How people who are going through that environment feel can be really valuable, more valuable whether there's sidewalks or how wide the sidewalk is or whether there's street trees. So from a community-based, sort of bottom-up type of process of collecting this type of data, those types of subjective questions could be quite important. 
Right. So what's the segment type? This is a low volume road, a high volume road, an off street path. Uh, what are all the different um, uh, land uses along it? Single family, multifamily, mobile homes, restaurant, commercial, industrial, vacant. Is it vacant? Is it recreation along the path? What's the slope of that particular road? Is there a dead end at the end of the segment? Uh, what's the type of path? Is it a dirt path, a paved trail, sidewalk? Is it made out of asphalt, concrete, brick, stone, gravel, dirt, sand, etc.? Are there obstructions in the path, like utility poles in the middle of the sidewalk, trees, parked cars? You know, what's going on when you're walking through that space? Are there crossing aids at the end of the segment or in the middle of the segment? Is there a sidewalk? And if so, is the sidewalk complete? How many connections are there either at either end? Can you go straight and both right and left? And is there maybe a mid-block crossing? This is a way to, to capture all the different route choices you have as you're walking through space. And what's the condition of the sidewalk here? Let's see, what's the condition of the road, number of lanes, what's the posted speed limit? Is there on-street parking? Because that's a buffer between walking and the flow of traffic. Do you have to walk through parking lot to get to housing, apartments, commercial businesses from that sidewalk? Are there how many driveways do you need to cross in a particular section of sidewalk? So from one intersection to the next, if you're walking down a block of segment, how many potential conflict points or driveways are you crossing where you have to constantly pay attention? Is a car coming in, a car coming out? So those all impact sort of whether you want to walk a certain route or not. Are there traffic lights, curb cuts, uh, different types of uh, uh, pavement markings? Let's see, are there any amenities along the way? Garbage cans, benches, bike parking, water fountain. You know, so is it actually kind of a nice, pleasant place? If you get tired, is there a place where you could sit down? And then what, uh, let's see. And then the, la the last, oh, actually I have that on there twice, don't I? Well, I forget what's on page 11, but on page 12, uh, also included the capacity to take a digital photo of your area and have the file name of that photo embedded into the GIS database. So you can well, take a picture of the area to link to all the things that you've just collected. Or if you're collecting data and you're not quite sure how to measure something, you take the picture, bring it back to the office or your research team and say, I don't know how to rate this one, I'm not sure. Or if you're publishing this in a web map form and you want to include pictures associated with different street segments, it's a way to, to uh, to collect that type of data. And what's neat about this tool is that you're not only taking the picture with a digital camera, but the digital camera is integrated into the PDA and the GIS system with the file name embedded into it. So it's all sort of seamlessly integrated. And this is just uh, one example of uh, an output that was based on collecting data in this way. So there's all these different variables. Uh, in this case, uh, uh, student Chris Ackerson took those variables and took a subset of those variables and created a safety rating. And real simply, using the four schools, just created three different colors, right? green, yellow, red, streets that were safe, streets that were unsafe, and streets that were in the middle. And, and real quickly, you can start to see how these different schools perform with the walkable infrastructure. So in Springfield, there's actually a fairly good network close by, and then some mediocre areas. There's a couple segments that weren't so good. In Pilot Butte, there's actually scored quite poorly. In Agnes Stewart, there's a sort of weird mix. And in Skyview, didn't do so well either. And so it may be that you don't want to have all, well, it would be nice if these were all great, safe places to walk. But in terms of safe routes to school, which is a, a big uh, push that's happening now, maybe you want to try to identify two or three key routes and work on those first. So if you have a route that already has, that already has some good, space on it, then maybe you focus on you know, the segments that are just doing neutral and make that a key route so that people funnel up and on. Kind of like a collector route for pedestrians. So there's all kinds of different analysis and ways that you could represent this. But again, the idea here is that we're collecting data on the walkable environment, the urban form, street segment by street segment. So you're actually outside breathing fresh air and looking around you as you're collecting this type of data and really being able to collect a whole lot of nuanced data about the form. Which leads me into, uh, uh, I'll just talk about briefly just two 
um, projects that I'm working on now that will hopefully actually take these concepts to a place that maybe I can come back next year and, and be able to report uh, back some findings. So the first is a follow-up to the transit-oriented development work that I showed earlier. Uh, and it's a pedestrian route choice to transit study. And so what we're asking, Asha Weinstein, who's a professor at San Jose State, and I are doing this project, is why do pedestrians choose the route they do when they're walking to transit? It's pretty interesting. So if someone doesn't walk the shortest path from home to transit, why? Why would you choose a path that's not the most efficient? And so we want to understand what's a, what that's about. So we're going to use this audit tool, audit all the streets within, we don't know yet, a mile to a mile and a half, say, of transit stops, both here in Portland and in San Jose or the Bay Area. Actually, we're going to do one in El Cerrito. Um, and get a measure of the walkability. We're going to survey people. So we're going to pa pass out a survey to people who have walked to transit. And part of the survey is to ask them, why did you choose the route you did? Or did you choose your route to avoid a route, uh, an intersection or a street segment somewhere else? And we're going to ask people to trace, tell us the exact route that they took. So we're going to take the exact route that they took, compare that to the shortest route they could have taken, and see if there's something about the urban form that's, that's influencing or part of people's decision-making process. It, we don't know how it's going to go. So you could imagine not taking your shortest, shortest route because you pick up a friend on the way, or you want to pick up a coffee on the way, or you just like to walk on a commercial area because there's more going on and you feel safer. Some people might not want to walk on a commercial area because there's too much going on and then it feels less safe. So there's all kinds of different reasons and we're not sure how it's going to shake out. Uh, the first survey is going out um, this week or next, hopefully, um, and we hope to conclude the research by late spring, hopefully. So maybe I'll have to come back next year. And the uh, other really neat and exciting project is a Safe Routes to School uh, module on this PDA. So instead of using this sort of 12-page, all of this data to collect, we're developing a, mo a module, an audit tool, that's just focused on just those variables that are important for Safe Routes to School. And we're going to begin, we're going to be developing that. Um, it's being developed now. And hopefully within a month from now, we'll start going out to different communities around the country and testing this out. And the idea is that we'll take these PDAs with a GIS and get a bunch of them, 15 or 20 of them, go to a community, work with a community, work with parents, policymakers of a particular school, and as a group, we'll collect that data. So it's not researchers going and collecting data on a community, it's a community collecting the data themselves and really not only observing the environment that the kids have to walk through, but also being involved in collecting the data and seeing the, the results in, almost instantaneously about how things, uh, how things work or don't work. So it's seen, uh, we're doing that both as a um, data analysis um, approach, a community education approach, and also with this action orientation to it. That if we get the right people collecting the data and involved in this, then they'll uh, form sort of a political action have a political advocacy and action capacity to actually implement the change. So this is the, I think this is the, the last substantive slide. And it's um, just a, an aside, actually. Um, it's my attempt to link bike ped together, even though I've just said um, they're different. And it's, a, it's a, another application of the use of this tool. So the city of Eugene um, asked someone in the department uh, to do an inventory of bike facilities downtown Eugene. And um, really quickly, a student put together one of these PDA GIS forms of different data, walked the streets of downtown Eugene, and uh, recorded where each of the bike racks were, the capacity of each bike rack, so how many bikes could you fit there, and then how many bikes were actually parked there. So there's some flaws in all that, because it depends on what day of the week and what time of the day to see how much parking there is being utilized. But you get a pretty good sense really quickly of where all the bike parking is in downtown. This larger circle represents the maximum capacity of that bike rack. The, the darker <coughs> filled in orange represents how many bikes are actually used. So 
you start to get a sense of well, where are the gaps in potential bike parking? Where might there be too much bike parking? And so it's in one day, go out and collect this data, already in a GIS format, come back, make a map pretty easily, and really communicates a lot of information. So what wasn't collected here, which I think would be interesting, is where are bikes parked that they shouldn't be? So like to a tree or to a, to a parking meter, or you know, where are all the sort of innovative ways where you know, people park their bikes? And then look, you know, plot those on top of here and see if is it people just being lazy, they didn't want to go 15 feet closer, or are, they, are there places that people are parking their bikes where we don't want them, really a result that we don't have par bike parking close enough? And so it's some type of data that you can really only get by walking the streets and paying attention. And this tool provides a way to collect that type of data. <clears throat> so of course, in the end, it's not about you know, the GIS and the walkability analyses. It's about this. It's about getting people out there and utilizing the infrastructure uh, and walking to places that they want to get to. In this case, walking to school. So this was a, a, a celebrity a walk to school for International Walk to School Day at uh, Edison Elementary in Eugene. And here's the celebrity. And, <laughs> and he was accompanied by the basketball coach of the University of Oregon, who just sort of tagged along. And that's, that's the celebrity's son. <laughs> and the daughter is back there somewhere. Um, but this is really what it's all about. So the research, the understanding about what makes good walkable urban form is really all about getting people out there and being active and being able to access the places that they want to go through an alternative to having to drive or being driven. So I just want to make a few quick acknowledgments. Uh, I mentioned uh, Nat Brown, who was a graduate student of mine who did uh, bulk of the work on the transit-oriented development research uh, page. Paulson Phillips, who's actually uh, here, is also a graduate student in our program who did bulk of the work on school siting in Oregon and the middle school research, and now she works up here in Portland. Uh, Michael Ronkin, who I mentioned at the beginning for images, graphics, and he's always inspiring to hear his presentations. The Transportation Growth Management Program in the state that helped fund the school siting issue, and the Mineta Transportation Institute based out of San Jose State, which has uh, been funding the transit-oriented development research. So with that, uh, I'll thank you, and if you want more information about the actual work that I presented here to actually pay attention to some of the numbers. If you're interested, all of that is available linked through uh, uh, my website. So thank you very much. And we can have a discussion, questions. Open up to questions and remember to use the microphone. <clears throat> I'm going to sit. Yeah. Yeah, did you use uh, the Palm Pilots of the Ped thing to uh, look at the arterial roads and how did they compare to how you classified them before as bad on the, the Beaverton and Lloyd Center graphs? Um, that's something that I haven't done a lot of but I want to do. Actually, uh, a different student who I didn't mention here, um, part of his thesis was to look at, uh, if you use the roads classification that you get from the Tiger Road Network, which is just available for anywhere USA, USA for free, compared to how the streets were classified, this was in uh, Springfield, by the Lane Council of Governments, versus how the streets were classified by using this audit tool. And to try to compare to see how much value added do you get by um, using the, the audit tool. And um, actually, if I'm remembering correctly, the, the local Council of Governments data versus Tiger, there wasn't actually that much difference, but then there was a, a whole value added by using the, the PDA. Um, but actually, comparing the arterial designation by Metro or by Tiger versus how they play out on the PDA, I, I haven't looked at, but I'm, I'm fascinated with those types of, of different data comparisons, and that'll help inform um, whether you can just use the arterial classification as a simple, quick, and, gen and good generalization without going through the effort and trouble of actually walking all the streets and collecting it. Yeah. yeah. Hi, I'm Dakota with the City of Portland Office Hi. of Transportation and Safe Routes to School. <coughs> and I'm really interested in your Safe Routes to School um, audit tool. And I'm wondering, 
Are, is this going to be a complete package where you're developing a survey instrument as well to use with kids and families in addition to your walkabout analysis? Well, the, um, uh, the, the development of the audit tool is being done in conjunction with the National Center for Biking and Walking, which they lead the, they have a, a, this thing called the Walkable Community Workshops. Maybe you've heard of those where they work with communities and do these walkabouts. And so they're getting into the Safe Routes to School area, and they wanted to, to go this route of, of having this audit tool. So um, I'm just putting together the audit piece and the testing of it uh, from this community-based type of data collection approach. And so down the road, I could imagine as we test it out and see how it goes and see if it's worthwhile a worthwhile approach or not to introduce this type of technology that there'll be some package put together beyond what they already do. Sorry, you go ahead. Just a follow-up. <coughs> um, how would we get in line to be a partner community for a test school when the audit is developed? Well, let's just talk afterward because the, the, uh, the closer the better because we're, as in our testing phase, we'd love to minimize the costs of travel from Eugene. Um, so I know that uh, NCBW wants to focus on uh, more of an urban school, recognizing that a lot of the Safe Routes work thus far has been more on the sort of suburban um, and the urban form around suburban areas. And so they're interested in, at least at first, having a module that fo focuses more on an urban, um, more disadvantaged type of area um, to do it. So I'm not sure if there's been schools identified, but I can, yeah, I think that se probably seems really reasonable. So well, let's just connect afterward. Yeah, Rob. <coughs> so we have a question that came in by email from Lisa Van Winkle at LTD probably know. Yeah. Hi, Lisa. Uh, and I'll read it. It says, for middle school students who could walk or bike to and from school but don't, it seems the primary barriers are related more to convenience than safety. Even if the route has great sidewalks and safe intersections, what can persuade parents and students to overcome the following barriers? And there's a list. It seems that whether or not you build it, many don't walk or bike. And some of the barriers are added time to walk or bike. Just a second here. Uh, cool, rainy weather through much of the school year. Parents' desire to protect or spend transport time with their kids and bulky instruments and backpacks. <laughs> Long question. Yes, thank you, Lisa. Out there on Web World. Um, well, Lisa could probably answer all those questions better than I can. She runs this, the Smart Ways to School program down in Lane County. Um, and I know the... Uh, uh, she struggled a little bit with trying to get these walk bus programs going. Um, she's hooked parents together that live close by and um, been surprised at how difficult it's been to get parents to commit to one another to, to do something like this. Um, so I don't know the exact answer, but the, I, the first sort of thought that comes to mind around convenience is it seems to me that the argument can be fairly easily made that it's more convenient to just have to walk your child to the corner than to have to drive them all the way to school. So if you can walk your child to the corner where they can hook up with a walking bu school bus, that seems a lot more convenient than having to take them all the way to school. So part of it might be just the continued education and intervention in the school and reinforcement of, um, of those types of behaviors, which gets to a whole other area that I didn't talk about at all about here. I mean, this was about urban form. This was nothing about education, outreach, competitions within the school, which I know Lisa is involved in with quite, quite a bit, with actually supporting and promoting uh, this type of uh, activity. In terms of parents enjoying their quality time with their kids in the car, <laughs> I mean, I've, I've heard that too, and you, know, you have to res respect that if that's the alone time that parents have with their kids. You know, I'd, I'm a, I'm a little reluctant to, to judge that. I mean, I have judgments. I, I think it's a little bit sad, but if that's the truth, then 
so be it. I enjoy the quality time that I have with my kids when I'm walking or biking them to school, um, but that just works for, that works for me in terms of where I live and where my kids go to school and the flexibility that I have when I can get to campus. So I know there was a whole other th bunch of things on the list. So sorry if I didn't completely answer your question, Lisa. Actually, another email question. Okay, this was fancy stuff. Um, <laughs> from a PDA, and the question is, what is the average cost involved with a PDA device and software? And I'll extend the question then, uh, because we have some Palm GPS devices, and I don't know if your software is just Windows or whether it would work on the Palm also. Sure. So. A couple clarifications around that. So I'm using GIS software. My PDAs don't have a GPS involved. So I'm using base maps like the street network to identify the location where I am. So uh, the software I'm using is called ArcPad. It's an ESRI product like ArcView, ArcInfo, ArcGIS. So it runs on that same platform. The files that it creates and runs off of are shape files, which is the standard GIS uh, format for, those, for that company. It runs on Windows CE. Uh, so it won't run on Palm. And uh, cost of the devices themselves varied by the manufacturer. The ones that I'm using now, um, I have 21 of them. Uh, 14 or 15 of them are from Dell. Those are my most recent purchases. With an extended battery is about, and a memory, a little bit of extra memory storage is about $500 each. The software, um, I don't know exactly. The, at the, on campus, we have a site license for all Esri software. I think ArcPad is around $400. And then there's an accompanying piece of software called Application Builder, which actually allows you to build the, the data entry screens, which might be around the $1,000, $1,300 mark. So a little bit of upfront investment um, for that. Um, well, for schools that are interested in um, kind of doing something like this on their own before this comes out, the ArcPipe thing comes out, or and if they can't afford it or it's not available to them, are there um, sort of paper pencil methods available that you could talk about? You know, so a school could do a sort of survey on sure. their own or to find some safe routes to school, and then also. Um, the quarter mile, half mile sort of perception that seems to be ingrained in everything. And um, just kind of your thoughts on how to change that or if it's changing, because um, that's something that I've thought about too and kind of noticed. And I know lots of kids and people that walk a lot more than half a mile. Right. So, and I think it, it affects our decisions as planners is, you know, how far out you kind of extend your thinking for planning. Sure. So in terms of the uh, paper and pencil, this particular tool isn't in that form, but there's, I mean, there's all kinds of safe routes to school, clearinghouse websites that have different types of um, checklists and, and tools. I don't know if there's any that go at this level, sort of when you're walking down a path, notice all of these things specifically, <coughs> check off this box, and here's how you add them up, although that would be a nice um, approach. And it might be something that emerges out of what I'm doing. So we're going to try the technology approach and see if that's useful. And maybe at the end of the day, using the technology, saying, well, it was kind of nice, but a paper and pencil is just as effective, especially for catalyzing um, uh, people into action and, un and understanding. Uh, so I can't p point you to a specific one. But there are some Safe Routes to School checklists and walkability checklists out there online. In terms of the quarter mile, half mile perception, you know, I don't know. The, the desirability of the destination, the convenience, the, the more people that do it, the more people that will do it, um, the urban design of the area having being safe and pleasant. I mean, those are all different contributors that go into it. You can add to this if you want. Or anyone else can add to this if you want to. Just push the red button. <laughs> Uh, for streets that have uh, not performed very well on the walkability index, uh, do you have any thoughts on like remedial measures that could be taken to improve them? Sure. Uh, well, there's, I mean, there's all kinds of different urban design and streetscape enhancements, and it just depends on what's going on on a particular arterial. So it could be bulb outs at the corner, 
median in the middle of the road that allows the pedestrian to have a safe refuge as they're crossing. Um, different signage. I mean, there's all kinds of different approaches, and I'm I'm not the, the urban designer, uh, streetscape person. So someone like Michael Ronkin, who works for ODOT, that's sort of his his thing. And there's other people, urban designers, who concentrate um, on how to retrofit and redesign heavily auto-oriented spaces into a way that they're more of a complete street where that facilitate and support a, a multimodal approach. That pedestrians just aren't an afterthought, but they're actually given their own legitimate space alongside with automob automobile traffic. So, uh, sorry, I can't give you uh, specific um, examples, but there's books you can read them. Great Streets, um, it's all kinds of urban design books. Do that. Yeah. yeah. Um, to what extent do you think planners are are paying attention to this type of um, research? Uh, everyone is listening right now out there on the web. Are you kidding? Um, well, it's, it's interesting. Um, at least in the planning research, maybe a little bit of the practitioner side, what's really sort of pushing a, an increased awareness of this area is, is obesity and the, and the health epidemic and the idea that, that one portion of addressing that issue is how we build cities and neighborhoods that the urban form actually does influence and have an impact on physical activity. So that message has really started permeating um, permeating people's brains. I don't know how much it's translating into policy changes yet, but if the first phase is getting people aware and starting to look at the decisions they make with that filter, I think it's starting to, to happen. Another piece is through the, um, the last uh, transportation bill in Congress authorized the National Safe Routes to School program. So every state is going to be receiving a portion of that funding to implement um, either building projects, evaluation projects, promotional and educational projects around safe routes to school. So there's nothing like getting people to change their thinking and, and how they do things than, than money and project work. So there's sometimes it's hard for me because I'm in this world and, and in this world of walkability and physical activity and safe routes to school, it just seems like every day there's just something else new and exploding. And sometimes it's hard for me to see how well that's translating to the, to, to the policy side. Certainly cities like Portland are well aware of it, but cities like Eugene, Corvallis a bit, but they're already doing and already invested in biking and walking. So I don't know if that's helpful. Yeah. Um, when you sort of dis uh, eliminated the arterial streets, did you do any waiting system for any kind of amenities like signals or crosswalks or sidewalks, whether they're curb line or separated? Or we thought about it um, and then didn't do it. But one of the interesting things that you could conceivably do is, is imagine an arterial that's 100 feet wide. And, um, and if it's really poorly designed, maybe it feels like it's 200 feet. Or if it's designed really nicely, maybe it only feels like 50 feet. So if you s start with the assumption that uh, someone's willing to walk a half mile, Maybe that 100 feet of arterial is really 200 feet, or maybe it's only 50 feet. So the distance that you can go might be altered based on sort of the urban form or the amenities along, along the street network. But we haven't done that. One thing that I think we'll, we'll toy with with the, this latest round is to use a, a pedestrian level of service type of characterization with the measures that we used. And maybe we can begin to weight the street segments a little bit. To do to do that, so it's a, it's a desire. It gets a little complicated too when you include intersections. So how do you cross? Is there a crosswalk? What's the timing? How long is the the light? So when you start trying to get that into a GIS format, you have a, a layer that's your sidewalk layer. Well, first the stuff I was showing here was just the street center line. So first you got to have a sidewalk right and left side of the street, and then you have to have a data for the crossing at each intersection. So each intersection typically will have four crossings. So there's all, it gets into sort of a data, a data world that um, you either have to go for it or, or wait till a better time. And so we punted the first time. Yeah. So can I go here and then back there? Yeah. Uh, 
when you do these studies, do you have any way of compensating for like the presence of parks or open space? It seems like that would negatively affect the street connectivity, but might be socially beneficial. Sure. So when we're looking at the street connectivity, it's over a, a larger area. So um, it could average out, uh, but I, I mean, I see your point that if you had a park that was occupying part of that space, it would reduce your overall, say, street density because there was no streets. In the case of having a park, it, you could put in the, the paths through the park to compensate for that. So the idea with some of the analysis and measures that I was using is you don't want to rely on just one variable to characterize the walk walkability of space, that you really want to try to use multiple variables and multiple measures and through looking at them all together get a sense of it. But I mean I I see your point. It's well taken. And it's it's actually interesting is when you look at around the Lloyd transit stop, you get this kind of weird thing going on. You get this hole around the transit stop that kind of shows up that it's not really well connected. Well what's going on there? A big part of that is a is a park. A big part of that is a parking lot too. So it's there's actually kind of a, a mixture of things. And then parking lots is a whole other thing. Is a parking lot a pedestrian travel way? Well, if there's no cars in the parking lot, it's one giant sidewalk, kind of. Um, so you, anyway, you start getting into making some of those distinctions. But if you use multiple methods of measuring and evaluating, uh, hopefully your, your, your measures sort of take those things into account. Yeah, Rob? I think you already answered the question, but I wanted John Merman to know, who's uh, watching over the web, I, that, that I saw his question about refining the, uh, the characteristics of arterials, since his point was arterials are not all alike. Of course. I had one kind of observation or question that relates back to my childhood, when I didn't know I was going to be a transportation person. But I remember um, when I played the French horn, and... Um, my parents bought an inexpensive used horn for me to leave at home and use the school horn at school. And I also, in, in uh, junior high, bought an algebra book at a garage sale so I could leave the algebra book at school and I had one at home. And I was just wondering if, if schools have looked at, I mean, obviously books are expensive, but have they ever looked at the, the benefits of, you know, providing two tubas to a kid wanting to leave at home? Uh, That's likely to happen, Rob. I mean, we're but just, you, you know, a wash in money for schools these days. If you look days. at the life cycle health costs of obesity, I, you know, the cost of an old bent tuba for a kid to practice on at home is probably pretty small compared to the health costs. <laughs> true, I mean, true. There's, you know, there's all sorts of related issues around school. So, as I tried to say, the urban form is but one of them, and there's all kinds of, of different ways to approach obesity, childhood obesity, walking and biking, and I think that's you know, a reasonable thing to look into. Um, I, I don't know of those examples doing that. I think a, a quicker, better place to look at is how do we decide where new schools are located and how do we build the infrastructure around it to actually make, make it so that we can um, walk there. So when you have busing is paid out of one fund and land acquisition paid out of another fund, there's no incentive for a school to locate centra centrally because they don't have to pay for the transportation costs. It's a federal responsibility mostly. So there's sort of small small approaches and, and large approaches. And, and I think it's just going to have to take a combination of, of a lot of those different things. So you had a very progressive family, it sounds like. <laughs> I didn't know you were a tuba player. French, French, French. French horn, sorry. Yes. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Mark. And uh, next, uh, next week we have Roger Lindgren from um, Oregon Institute of Technology coming to speak. So we hope we see some of you then. And let's uh, thank Mark. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> we can continue the dialogue if you want.